As a descendant of Cuban immigrants and someone who's been raised in a community of Cuban exiles and as a man who cares deeply about the well-being of the Cuban people, one of my greatest hopes is to live to see the nation of Cuba and its people become free and open and democratic. And that's exactly why today's announcement from the White House is so profoundly disappointing. It is a victory for the oppressive Cuban government, but a serious setback for the repressed Cuban people. The White House has conceded everything and gained little. They gain no commitment on the part of the Cuban regime to freedom of press or freedom of speech or elections. No binding commitment was made to truly open up the internet. No commitment was made to allowing the establishment of political parties or to even begin the semblance of a transition to democracy. And in exchange for all of these concessions, the only thing the Cuban government agreed to do is free 53 political prisoners who could wind up in jail tomorrow morning if they once again take up the cause of freedom and to allow the United Nations and the Red Cross to monitor conditions on the island. The same United Nations that did nothing when Cuba last year was caught helping North Korea evade United Nations sanctions. This entire policy shift announced today is based on an illusion, on a lie. The lie and the illusion that more commerce and access to money and goods will translate to political freedom for the Cuban people. All this is going to do is give the Castro regime, which controls every aspect of Cuban life, the opportunity to manipulate these changes to perpetuate itself in power. These changes will only lead to greater wealth and influence for this oppressive regime, especially the military, which controls most, if not all, of the Cuban economy and controls all of its oppressed people. These changes will lead to legitimacy for a government that shamelessly, continuously, abuses human rights, but it will not lead to assistance for those whose rights are being abused. It is just another concession to a tyranny by the Obama administration, rather than a defense of every universal and inalienable right that our country was founded on and stands for. In short, what these changes are going to do is they will tighten this regime's grip on power for decades to come. And it will significantly set back the hopes of freedom and democracy for the Cuban people. Now I am overjoyed for Alan Gross and his family. He has been a hostage of this regime who was kept against his will for far too long. Our prayers are with him and his family because he was not just a prisoner, he was a hostage. But this president has proven today that his foreign policy is more than just naive. It is willfully ignorant of the way the world truly works. This administration just last week finally agreed, after months of congressional pressure, to impose sanctions on the Venezuelan government officials who are violating human rights. A government that has spent all of 2014 appallingly killing, jailing, and violently oppressing its own people. And yet a week later, this administration is making historic concessions to the very Cuban government that supports and is behind the tyranny in Venezuela. The Cuban government is influential at the highest levels of the Venezuelan regime and has helped them mastermind the crackdown on the Venezuelan people. This policy contradiction is absurd and it is disgraceful for a president who claims to treasure human rights and human freedom. This president is the single worst negotiator we have had in the White House in my lifetime who has basically given the Cuban government everything it asked for and received no assurances of any advances in democracy and freedom in return. Let me close by reminding everyone that God bestowed on the Cuban people the same rights that he did on every other man, woman, and child that has ever lived. The inalienable rights spoken about in our founding documents. The Cuban people, like all those oppressed around the world, they look to America to stand up for these rights, to live up to our commitment to the God-given right of every person to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. These rights exist not just for people born in the continental United States, but for people everywhere. It is unacceptable 
that the only people in this hemisphere that do not know democracy and have not known democracy for more than five decades is the people of Cuba. That should be our overriding objective, to do all we can to bring about political democratic openings in Cuba. And then a free Cuban people can decide whatever economic model they want. But the measures taken today will do nothing to bring about that day. And in fact, I fear will significantly set it back. Today, by conceding to the oppressors, this president and this administration have let the people of Cuba down. Senator, Senator. Uh, Colonel, you know, lawmakers often decide who's in the press not to ask questions or hypotheticals. You laid out some things here about uh, what you think will happen uh, or continue to happen based on this policy. Here. We've seen other foreign policy things where there have been critics, Good Friday uh, Accords, uh, Camp David, and so on, and those things worked out pretty well. Why are you so confident in this case that things will continue to be? Because I know the Cuban regime and its true nature better than this president does or anybody in his administration does. This is a regime that manipulates every single concession this country has ever made to their advantage. When we opened up travel by Cubans to the United States, they deliberately chose to allow people to come to this country, but forced them to leave their families behind. That way they would guarantee that these people would send back remittances to Cuba. When groups travel to Cuba, they deliberately stage the events they want people to see and deny them access to others. This is a regime that single-handedly manipulates who the opposition is. They even have a state-sponsored opposition so they can put up the facade to the world that they actually have opponents in their own country that are allowed to speak freely. Time and again, the Cuban government has manipulated every single concession this administration has made to their advantage. The number one goal of the Cuban government and of this regime is to remain in power. And anything we do will be turned by them into a mechanism for remaining in power. The Cuban government will never allow any changes on the island that will threaten their ability to maintain a grip on power. We've seen that time and time again, and you're going to see that again in the months and years to come. Senator Rubio, you call the president the worst negotiator. He said a short time ago he wants to work with Congress to do the things necessary to normalize relations, to establish an embassy. What specifically can Congress do, and do you expect Congress to do, in response to what the president's looking for? Well, my sense is uh, I anticipate I'll be the chairman of the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee of Foreign Relations. And I anticipate we're going to have a very interesting couple of years discussing how you're going to get an ambassador nominated and how you're going to get an embassy funded. Senator, 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 Senator about the, uh, the exchange with the, the three remaining Cuban five, this had been rumored for months, maybe even more, that this was in the works, that this was a possibility in order to get Alan Gross back. What's your reaction to that? And if you well, can also respond in Spanish. Okay. Yes. I'm glad that Alan Gross is back. He never should have been there to begin with. And let me just take this moment to point out something the president said which is factually incorrect. The president said that the people of Cuba do not have access to advanced 21st century modern technology for communications and telecommunications because of the U.S. embargo. That is false. The reason why they don't have access to 21st century telecommunications like smartphones, like access to the internet, is because it's illegal in Cuba. The reason why Alan Gross was taken hostage was because he was trying to help a small Jewish community in Cuba have access to that equipment. So for the president to say that the reason why they don't have access to telecommunication equipment is because of the U.S. embargo is categorically false. The second point I would make to the president is the Cuban government is going to control the internet the same way the Chinese government controls the internet and the Iranian government controls the internet and the North Korean government controls the internet. This notion that Cuba is going to allow the Cuban people to access any website they, they want is ridiculous. They are not going to allow that to happen. My last point on it is I'm glad that Mr. Gross is back with his family. I'm always concerned any time we trade legitimate spies in exchange for an innocent American because it sets a precedent. It actually now creates an incentive for other governments to take innocent Americans hostage in the hopes of getting something in return out of it. But I am happy he's with his family today, and I've focused my remarks here today and my criticisms on the unilateral changes the president has made to policy towards Cuba, which I think will have a dramatic impact on the cause of freedom and democracy on the island. Brevemente quiero decir que estoy muy contento de que Alan Gross ha regresado con su familia. No critico el término de que está aquí con nosotros, porque estoy muy agradecido que él esté aquí. Él no nunca supuesto haber estado encarcelado en Cuba. Realmente no hizo nada incorrecto. A mí no me gusta cuando se hace este tipo de intercambio porque crea un precedente.
que otros gobiernos pueden abusar, coger un americano preso para tratar de cambiarlo por tres espías. Él no era un espía. Pero vuelvo y repito, yo he concentrado mis críticas sobre los cambios de política de Estados Unidos hacia Cuba, porque creo que eso realmente es lo que va a tener un impacto duradero sobre este tema, del tema de la libertad de Cuba. Sí, yes, ma'am. Bueno, anticipo que vamos a tener una conversación muy interesante con la administración sobre cómo van a confirmar un embajador a la embajada en La Habana y cómo van a conseguir los fondos para una embajada en La Habana. Yo creo que va a ser muy interesante durante los próximos meses y años ese tema. Well, a couple points. Um, I think that my understanding is that the influence that his holiness had was on the release of Mr. Gross, which I've not criticized. As I said, I'm happy that he's with. Uh, the Cuban people. I would also ask His Holiness to take up the cause of freedom and democracy, which is critical for a free people, uh, for people to truly be free. I think the people of Cuba deserve the same chances to have democracy as the people of Argentina have had, where he comes from, as the people of Italy have, where he now lives. Uh, obviously in the Vatican's its own state, but very nearby. My point is, I hope that, uh, that people with that sort of prestige on the world stage will take up the cause of freedom and democracy. The Cuban people are the only people in this hemisphere that have not been able to elect a leader in more than 55 or 60 years. It's outrageous. And for us to basically, for this government under Barack Obama, to unilaterally give up all the things they gave up in exchange for nothing on the side of democracy is unacceptable in my mind. Sir, yes, ma'am. This is unrelated to anything prior. We're not going to discuss that today. You just mentioned the issue of the president unilaterally giving things up. Do you see this move as yet another unilateral move done by the president without sufficient consultation with Congress? Well, we're going to study very carefully whether any of these measures um, contradict the spirit or letter of the law with regard to the C uh, Helms Burton Act and the Cuban Democracy Act. I, I would say that. I would concede that many of the changes that have been made today, such as diplomatic relations, fall within the purview of the presidency. My criticisms are largely based on the, the fact that these are unwise decisions. The fact that I now know for fundamental truth that this is going to make the day democracy comes to Cuba even further away. Sir? What's going to happen here is they're going to utilize these changes to create more wealth, uh, more funding for the repressive regime. What's going to happen now is American companies will become deeply vested in the Cuban economy, and in a few years you're going to see them here in the halls of Congress lobbying to protect the status quo because they have a pretty good deal going. I saw that this week when we tried to, when we pursued and passed a bill uh, that supported democracy protesters in Hong Kong. And my office was getting phone calls from companies that do business in China asking us to back off. You're going to see that here now too. So I'm happy to see Alan Gross re uh, released from prison, but that, of course, goes uh, hand in hand with these announcements today about a change changes in Cuban policy towards Cuba. So would you have rather seen him remain in prison? Well, well according, to the, uh, according to the White House, they do not go hand in hand. According to the White House, Mr. Gross was released on humanitarian grounds, and the interchange between the United States and Cuba on the three spies that were here in the United States was in exchange for a counterintelligence asset that was held prisoner in Cuba, according to the President, for more than 20 years. And that's a separate topic, uh, which I'm constrained in my ability to discuss in depth. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, the three prisoners, uh, the, the three uh, spies that were in U.S. custody were not benign spies that were going around cutting out newspaper clippings. At least two of them were involved in direct information given to the Cuban government that led to the murder of American citizens who were patrolling the Straits of Florida over international waters trying to save the lives of Cuban rafters. President Obama uh, alluded to young Cuban Americans, most of them are in your hometown of Miami, saying that they accept more normal relations, uh, which is quite different from what you're saying of a 43-year-old senator. How do you explain the, the, the younger generation which wants to see what President Obama is? Well, partially because while I'm 43, I feel 44. And part of it because, um, look, this is not a political thing. You know, I don't care if the polls say that 99% of people believe we should normalize relations in Cuba. Um, I still believe that before we can normalize relations in Cuba, democracy has to come first, or at least significant steps toward democracy. I would further say to you that I think we share 
including the, 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 the individuals the president discussed generationally, the goal for freedom in Cuba. We may disagree on the tactics, but we share the goal of freedom and democracy. And I would say that if you went to the majority of people out there and said, we're going to diplomatically recognize them, we're going to open up the banking sector, the telecommunications sector, we're going to increase remittances, we're going to do all, and in exchange, all Cuba's going to do is release 53 political prisoners they can put back in jail next year if they take up the cause of freedom and democracy, most people would say, well, that's not the kind of deal we had in mind. Let me be clear. I am in favor of normalizing relations with Cuba. But for that to happen, Cuba has to be normal. Cuba has to be a democracy. I, the day that Cuba becomes a democracy or takes significant steps towards democracy, I will be the first one standing up here saying, now is the time for change of, Cuba's po of U.S. policy towards Cuba. That day clearly is not today. Senator Rizzo, yeah. Yeah. last month uh, Tony Blinken told you that uh, the administration wouldn't move forward on, on anything on, on Cuba without consulting Congress. How much did the administration tell you if they did consult Congress uh, with Tony Blinken lying under oath? Well, um, a couple points. I was aware of these measures last night, not from the administration. I chose not to discuss it at the time because I did not want to imperil the safety and well-being of Mr. Gross, who, I, as I understood, was either in route or potentially in route within the next few hours. Uh, I was not consulted by anyone in the administration until around 10 a.m. this morning when Secretary Kerry placed a call to me and outlined basically what I already knew about it. I expressed to Secretary Kerry my belief that uh, they're being incredibly naive if not willfully ignorant about the impact that this is going to have on Cuba. This fantasy that somehow if more American products are available to Cuba and more American travelers go to Cuba, that all of a sudden democracy is going to spring is outrageous and ridiculous. The notion uh, that somehow this is going to lead to a second Cuban revolution as a result of the fact that Cubans are not going to be able to buy more products from the United States is ridiculous. And I express those sentiments to Secretary Kerry. I know this regime's true nature. I interact with people that, inter that have been oppressed by it every single day. These changes will do nothing to change their behavior towards the Cuban people. No. It will be just as repressive to, uh, a year from now as it is today. So you're saying Congress was not consulted before the decision was made? Well, I don't know if they consulted other members of Congress. Certainly senators that were on that airplane were consulted about where they were going. I was not consulted before these deci this, this decision was made, and I spoke to no one in the administration about it until 10 a.m. this morning. Senator what realistically can you do here in Congress if you are going to continue to be opposed? You talked about the ambassador nominations, what else? And again, on 2016, what does this mean for your opinion? Well, I'm not discussing 2016 today out of respect for the gravity and the importance of this issue. I would just say on the issues that we can do here in Congress, we're going to do everything we can. And we're going to carefully look at what those leverage points are for us to influence policy towards Cuba. And it's something that I'm personally committed to being a part of. And by the way, I'm also committed to liberty and freedom and democracy in Venezuela and in Hong Kong and in Iran and in everywhere in the world where it's challenged, including China, which is why I've been a consistent and outspoken critic of the Chinese government. And as I re and, 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 but Cuba's close to home for me both because of my heritage, also because of the community I live in. I know literally hundreds of people that have lived under this repressive regime. I know firsthand how this repressive regime manipulates families for purposes of perpetuating themselves in power. I know what they're capable of doing to people who speak out against the regime and what it does. And none of that is going to change. None of the measures taken today will do absolutely, will do absolutely nothing to change that course. Senador, ¿puedo repetir en español lo que dijo de las habilidades de negociación del presidente? Usted dijo unas cosas muy fuertes en inglés que quisiera se las puede Sí, el presidente es el peor negociador que ha tenido este país durante mi vida y posiblemente en su historia. Este presidente la ha entregado al régimen de Raúl Castro todas las concesiones que ellos pidieron en cambio por básicamente nada. Lo único que recibimos fue que 53 presos políticos han sido liberados, presos políticos que el día de mañana pueden caer presos de nuevo si toman de nuevo la causa de la democracia dentro de Cuba. How committed you are to blocking the funding for an embassy and blocking the nomination of an ambassador, given the fact that you now control the Senate majority the Republicans do, and you have actually a lot more power to influence that. Have you made a decision, and are you committed to blocking that? I'm committed to doing everything I can to unravel as many of these changes as possible. Have you figured out yet which ones you can unravel and how you can go about them? Well, we're, we're, obviously it's been just a few hours since this announcement's been made, but we take this very seriously. And it is the role of Congress to provide oversight over these sorts of issues mm -hmm. and to implement policy. And the President's job is to execute policy, uh, which time and again he seems to have forgotten. But I intend to use every tool at our disposal in the majority
uh, to unravel as many of these changes as possible. And I do so not out of any sort of animosity towards the administration, but out of animosity towards the Cuban regime's repression of the Cuban people. You yeah. said it is a part of a big issue in Florida, especially in Miami, with the divide there in the 2016 election. I have n I've never analyzed this issue from an electoral perspective, and I'm, I, I just don't do it. And this is how I passionately feel. I, I, I have no idea. And quite frankly, it's irrelevant uh, for me. As I told you earlier, I don't care if 99 percent of people in polls disagree with my position. This is my position, and I feel passionately about it. If, and I'm, I'm glad that I'm on the side of freedom and democracy. I'm glad that I'm on the side of human rights. And I, and I hope that we can have majorities here in the Congress to overturn these changes that were imposed today that I think set back that cause. Senator, the President said today that you can't keep doing the same thing over and over that doesn't work. Do you disagree with his assessment that the policy of the past five decades hasn't worked? Yeah, I think we should. In fact, that's a good point. And I would say that we should increase uh, the measures that we take against Cuba as a result of, for example, their violation of UN sanctions. Last year, in the Panama Canal, a ship that left Havana was intercepted. And on that ship was cargo that clearly violated UN sanctions against North Korea. And this government did nothing. And it should have. Uh, this government has backed away from democracy programs in Cuba and has actually apologized for them in some occasions with regards to USAID. <coughs> this government has been slow to criticize Cubans' human rights violations over the last few months, in particular when given multiple opportunities to do so. This government accepted Cuba's uh, attendance at the Summit of the Americas in Panama later this year, a summit that was put together uh, as a collection of democracies. It never was intended to include a repressive dictatorial military dictatorship which is what Cuba is. And so I actually think that he's right in that. We should have, but, we, but I disagree in what he's done about it. Now this argument that somehow the embargo hasn't worked and so therefore let's try something completely different, it sounds good on paper, but here's the reality. Just because we change our policy towards Cuba doesn't mean Cuba is going to allow us to do anything we want. Yes, there's going to be uh, potentially more American telecommunications companies in Cuba, but what people are going to be able to, who people are going to be able to call and what they're going to be able to view on the internet is going to be completely controlled by the Cuban government. Yes, there'll be more remittances allowed, but where people are going to get to spend that money is going to be completely controlled by the Cuban government. Yes, more trips are going to be allowed, but that's going to be completely controlled by the Cuban government, and it all is going to be controlled to their benefit. They are not going to agree to anything that destabilizes their grip on power. And the sooner policymakers like the president realize that, the less these sorts of ridiculous policies we're going to get from them. Bueno, la, yo creo que el gobierno de Corea del Norte es un gobierno terrorista y la, eh, la Habana y Cuba el año pasado ayudaron a, a Corea del Norte a evadir sanciones de Naciones Unidas. Eso ahí es evidencia de que ellos apoyan, eh, eh, la, la, ellos apoyan el terrorismo. Pero yo creo que es evidente que el presidente, no sé por qué lo va a revisar, obviamente ya dijo en sus comentarios hoy que ya eso es su decisión sobre si Cuba debe permanecer en esa lista o no. I'll answer that question is about uh, Cuba's presence on the, uh, the list of state sponsors of terror. And I would make two points. I think North Korea is a terrorist government. This is a government that, whether it's hacking or kidnapping movie stars or others, and I mean, it's a terrorist government. It is a criminal syndicate terrorist government. And last year, in the Panama Canal, a ship was, was, inter was, was intercepted, carrying cargo from Havana to Cuba that violated UN sanctions against North Korea. That sounds like sponsorship of terrorism to me. Now, I don't know why the president is saying they're going to review whether they belong on that list. When in a statement a few moments ago, he said it was made no sense in the 21st century for a country like Cuba to be on the list. It sounds to me like he's already made up his mind. I think I have time for one more if there is one more. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk about the prospects of con this next Congress being able to actually lift the formally? <coughs> this Congress is not going to lift the embargo. Thank you.